In John chapter 14, I'm going to begin with verse 9. Jesus said to him, he's talking to Philip, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen the Father, or he who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Father, I pray that you bless your word in Jesus' name. Philip was a... You know, the, the, the disciples that Jesus had, 12 disciples, every one of them had a specific personality and a different type of character. And Philip was an inquisitor. He was one that always asked a lot of questions. There's not very much said about him, but the times that there is something said, it's usually in some type of question. You know, there's, there's those that are around us that have those kind of questions, and it's always good. And, and I've learned that was a statement that I grew up with, but I've learned it to be fact says there's no such thing as a dumb question. The only dumb question that there is is the one you do not ask. So don't keep that dumbness or ignorance inside your brain. Submit it to your tongue. Ask that question and receive the answer. The moment you ask the question, it's no longer dumb. It's a smart question. Amen? Because it's coming from a, a man or a woman of great intellect. And the Bible says that the wise man increase in knowledge. So he makes that statement. He says, show us the Father. Why would he say, show us the Father? Will you show us the Father? Jesus walked around talking about the Father. Talked about his heavenly Father. He wanted to set a pace. He wanted everybody to recognize that I am the Son. So in order for you to recognize him as the Son, he had to declare a Father. It's an origination. We are who we hang with and where we come from. There's a lineage here, and so he asked that question, show us the Father. And Jesus made a, such an appropriate statement. He says, he who has seen me has seen the Father. Talks about how he came from the Father. Talks about everywhere he's going, he's going under the authority of the Father, under the power of the Father. I had to say that when I was growing up, I used to have to represent my dad in various areas. For those of you who do not know, my dad was uh, a minister in Harlingen. He and I started a church in Harlingen called Faith Pleases God Church. We started it inside the living room. And I wasn't the preacher, I was the guy behind the scenes, the son that said, okay, yes, dad, yes, sir. Whatever it takes, dad, yeah, you know, and sometimes I would question him. Most of the time I didn't, but sometimes I would. And it always turned out he had such great wisdom in his decisions, but everywhere I went, I had to behave myself wisely because I was a representative of my dad. When I was even a little boy, before I became minister, we used to go inside the, the barber shops in New York City, and you know, they, they would sit us in the barbers, old time barber shops, you know, the ones with the hot uh, lather that they put on the back of your neck. Oh, I always felt like a grown man, you know, when they broke out that warm lather, put it on the back of my neck, and they would shave the back of my neck and they'd sit me on that plank, you know, that board that they would put on the chair and, and they'd cut daddy's hair and then they'd cut my hair just like daddy's and he had it parted on the side and very short and around the ears and you know, the way it was. Now it's once again that way again. So exciting with the real sharp part, you know. Uh, there's a couple of places on my head that's lost a little bit of hair. I can't have those sharp parts anymore. <laughs> But I remember they, they'd say, how do you want your hair cut? And I'd say, just like daddy. And I'd put my hand on my hair. And they would cut our hair that way. Whatever my dad did, I wanted to do the same thing. And, uh, and so when I grew up and we ended, our, ended the ministry and I became, became a preacher and minister of the gospel, I dressed like him, I walked like him, I talked like him. And it was almost like reverse osmosis as I, I tried as a child to be like my dad, as I grew up, I became like my dad. My suits, my ties, everything looked the same. I had more hair than him as he got older, but people would watch us on television and sometimes wouldn't know the difference between my father and myself. You know, the TV sets maybe were not that clear, but we kind of looked and acted the same. And one day my dad told me, I was in San Antonio, my wife and I were living up in San Antonio. He said, son, I, I have a speaking engagement in Houston, Texas. Can, I can't make it. 
I need you to go be there for me. There's a plane ticket waiting for you at American Airlines countertop. That was back before the used to buy it on the internet, you know, and he said, just go to American Airlines. There's tickets waiting for you. Just get over there, get on a flight, get over to Houston. Uh, here's the address. He gave me the address and he said, uh, go there. You need to be there tonight. I'm like, what? And this was like two o'clock in the afternoon. So he's really putting the pressure on me, right? And so I said, Dad, where is this? He goes, I don't know. I just have an address. Just, but I can't be there. You need to be there for me. And I said, but Dad, they're expecting you. And he goes, hey, you've seen the son. You've seen the father. That's what he told me. I said, all right. So I called my friend up that lives in Houston, Carlos Flores. And Carlos picked me up at the airport. And I had given him the address. And, and he mapped it out. And, and we're driving over there. And Carlos looks at me and says, he says, Pastor, are you sure this is the right address? And I said, yes, the address they gave me. And I don't know. Is it? He goes, is it a church? And I said, I don't know. I don't know. I just, dad told me to be there by six o'clock. And, and so here I am. We got to get there. We're racing through traffic. As I notice we're getting closer, I start to realize, you know, we're over in the entertainment section, you know, where the, the you know, Six Flags Astro World was at and all that. And we pull up and and he goes, well, this is the address. And we pull up. I see all these cars in the parking lot. And I said, what? I called my dad. I said, dad, are you sure this is the right address? He says, son, that's the right address. That's the address they gave me. I'm looking at it printed on paper. And I, he goes, where is it? And I said, dad, it's the Astrodome. He goes, well, represent me well. And I'm thinking, oh my God, they're expecting my dad to speak at the Astrodome. So I'm thinking like a salon off to the side, a little, you know, a small meeting center. And the moment I, I, I stand out of the car, I go up to the location where they said to go. They look at me and they say, Pastor Ortiz, come on. We got to hurry up and get you up on the pulpit. And I said, well, well, well I'm, my father couldn't be here. They're dragging me. I said, my father couldn't be here. That's okay. Just come on. Don't worry about that. And I, so they, they leave me in the room with, and here's... Brother Bill Bright, I don't know if you know Brother Bill Bright, he's already gone home to be with the Lord, but Brother Bill Bright was a large ministry out of Florida, had an incredible ministry, thousands and thousands of people around the world, he's touched lives, his church had about 20,000 people in Florida, and, uh, and he says, uh, Pastor Carlos, how are you? And I said, well, I'm not, I'm not Pastor Carlos, I'm Pastor Clark, oh, come on, Pastor Carlos, and he just like, like almost those words didn't come out of my mouth, and and he leads me into the room with all these other preachers. And there's Pastor Don George out of Irving, Texas. And all these great men in, of God. And there, Pastor Carlos, so good. And after a while, I didn't want to correct them anymore because I was a, a bit embarrassed. And I, I, said, well, I, I said, well, I'll just call me Pastor Ortiz, you know, just kind of make it right. I didn't know what to do. And, and they looked at me and I, they, they, next thing I know, I'm being brought to the stage and as I'm being brought to the stage, there's another man, I forgot his name, large ministry up in San Antonio. And he brought me up on the stage, his pastor Carlos Ortiz, and put me up on the stage. And I'm like looking at this huge crowd of 60,000 people in this arena. And I preached and everybody laughed when they were supposed to laugh. They shouted when they were supposed to shout. And and uh, it was just dynamic. After everything was over, they, you know, they thanked me and and turned me loose. Nobody ever knew that it was me and it wasn't my dad. As much as I tried to tell them, it was like those words didn't even hit. I called my dad up and he said, uh, he said, how'd you do, son? I said, well, I got to tell you, you've never preached any better. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. You never preached any better. And it's such a, such an incredible life. And when I hear this and I read this scripture, when Jesus says, he who has seen me has seen the father. He's actually making a statement. He says, I am just the exact carbon copy exactly like our father. And we as kids, sometimes we grow up and we say to ourselves, we don't want to be like our mom and dad. Look, just give up. You're going to be just like your mom and dad, no matter how hard you try not to be. You're going to become like them. Even in your stating, I don't want to be, you become like them because they stated that one time. It's a, it's a, it's a lineage and a generational thing. It's God's divine purpose. 
In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 through verse 4, it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. The commandment with a promise. The promise is when you obey mom and dad, your life will be long on this earth. Long life. You want a long life? Obey mom and dad. Just be good to them. Honor them. Take care of them. Your life will be long. My, my dad used to say that almost like a threat. You better obey me because the Bible says I'll cut your life down in half. I said, what, dad? <laughs> he says, your life will be shortened if you disobey. And man, I would obey dad because I not only, number one, I feared God. Number two, I feared my daddy's belt. We believed in, he believed in corporal punishment. What they call corporal punishment. I hate that statement, corporal punishment. It's called sparing the rod, spoil the child. There's nothing corporal about it. It's the way of life. Generations upon generations have been, ex have been uh, raised by some type of punishment. The word even says, you know, father chastised the son. Celebrate the chastening of the Lord because if you don't celebrate the chastening of the Lord, then the Lord is not your father. What a powerful statement. A definition of who is your father is how are you disciplined? Huh. If you're not disciplined or you're not disciplining, you're not loving. Why? Because we're establishing a security for our children. I have three children. I have my oldest is a, is a girl. Her name's Christian Danielle. And then my second oldest four years later is Caleb Michael, Psalm 92 Ortiz. That's his name, Psalm 92 Ortiz, Caleb Michael. And the third is King Isaac, King of Laughter. From them, I have five grandchildren, four from my daughter and one from my oldest son. And the last one is not married as of yet. And uh, he's informed me he's not taking applications. <laughs> he, said, Son, he said, Dad, I just want to help you in the ministry. Not looking to get married. 25 years of age. Keeps himself pure. Stays away from any type of premarital sex. All of this comes from an upbringing. My children come from an upbringing. They disobey. They suffer a consequence. They obey. They receive a benefit. Not all consequences came from my hands. They come just by the scripture that says your life will be shortened if you disobey. There's things that happen to our lives when we disobey. You know, dad, I want to say something to you and single mom, pay very close attention to me. There's, there's something about being a dad there that, uh, you know, our responsibility is to be a provider and a protector of our families, a protector of our home. You know, there's a, there's a word that we use called alpha. The Bible says that Jesus is referred to as the alpha and the omega, the beginning, the end, the first, the last. Everything starts and stops with Jesus. Everything starts and stops with Jesus. He's the beginning and the end of all things, and he's everything in between. To be an alpha, there's a definition that we understand is socially dominant. Especially in a group. In animals, you know, we see that dominant person, that alpha. That alpha person sometimes is looked upon as a negative. Well, it's negative if you're an alpha without godly principles. But when you have godly principles and you're an alpha, you're the top dog. You know, the chief in charge. You do it with love and with care, with grace mercy. You do it with godly principles and understanding. As an alpha, we understand three very simple principles. Number one, you will always be in danger. Danger is all around you, no matter where you go as that alpha person. Number two, there is always an enemy lurking. There's always an enemy that's coming after you. Something, it could be poverty. It could be a, a thief trying to break in. It could be, it could be a bill. There's always an enemy lurking. And number three, it's always waiting for you to show your vulnerability. 
You know, these enemies, they look for breaches inside your system to see how they can get around you. And Alpha recognizes these challenges. My, my wife feels protected when I make sure that the doors are locked and everything's closed. And throughout all our years, you know, we would travel in many places, stayed in hotels. And, and she would ask me, said, honey, can you make sure that, that you sleep on this side of the bed, which happens to be the side of the bed where the door is to the hotel room. And she, every time I would do my responsibility, she would feel safe and secure. See, there's something about being that alpha. You're that person that is that strong tower, that measuring rod that everything should measure up to. Uh, an alpha doesn't mean you have to be running around with a strong arm with foul language, screaming profanities and yelling. The alpha is not the person who tells the wife, stay quiet, sit down, leave me alone. That's not an alpha. An alpha is a person who knows how to make decisions with stability and security. That they are the alpha. They don't have to run around saying they're the king of the home because the home already knows they're the king. And everybody who comes into that house knows they're the king. And they do it with love and grace. Three challenges to the alpha I want you to recognize. Three challenges. You got to define what it is. Who's that alpha? You got to define. There's a definition of it. You got to watch out for the hunter. The alpha is always, always watchful. Number one, define what is. Number two, watch out for the hunter. Number three, remain strong and keep his individuality. That's the hard part. Because you have your wife, you have your children, but you got to recognize that if there's ever a challenge, you gotta go attack it. You gotta be able to lift up that standard without having to ask for help. If you need it, you're in trouble, but that's fine. You have a helper that's with you, but you're the one who's supposed to be in charge. In today's environment, I wanted to talk along this line. In today's environment, the challenge that we have with our children today is the lack of the father or the lack of the father figure inside the home. And somebody says, no, no, but there's a dad in the house. Yeah, but is the dad really being a dad? Is he really being the alpha? It should be the father that says, let's go to church on Sunday. It should be the father that says, we need to pay our tithes and our offerings to the church. It should be the father that says, I will pray with you when you're sick. It should be the father that says, let us get into the word together. It should be the father that says, we're going to lift up our children and raise them in the way of God. Should be the father. He's the, he's the priest of the home. Greater than the king of the home. He's designed to be the priest of the home. The priest of the home. God never intended there to be a king and a kingdom. He wanted his kingdom, what is known now as a kingdom, which the true word was the church, his body, to be governed by the priest. But it was man in their frailty, man in their disappointments in themselves to say, well, I don't think we're willing to obey a priest. We need to have a king. And so God went ahead and established a king and he took his leader, his man, which was Saul or Samuel, who was a priest to anoint the king. This is why even today when we watch movies and every movie that has anything to do with kingship, a king or a queen, there's always some type of priest that's with them because it was already known that God desired there to be a priest that governed everything. That Saul had Samuel as his leader. But through rebellion, through jealousy, envy, bitterness, through the lack of the ability of being the alpha, the true alpha, Saul began to disobey Samuel. Didn't want to hear from Samuel. Was afraid to see Samuel. Didn't want to know anything about Samuel. Yet Samuel was God's chosen man. But because man wanted a king, he gave him a king. Saul, and Saul had to put a lot of pressure on the people. Instead of them listening to the priest, they listened to the king. If you're not the alpha in your house, mister, listen to me. If you're not the leader in the house, God will raise another. Because every home needs to have a leader. It's contrary to the, to the divine appointment that God has upon your life. And God will do the best that he can to be able to speak to another. If your wife is the alpha, 
It's because you're not rising to your occasion. You're not being the responsible one in your family. My wife has all the authority in the home because I gave her all the authority at home. And I make sure she always has the home. I make sure she always has a roof over her head. She has a car to drive. I make sure she has the best car. I want her to have the best clothes. I want her to look the prettiest. I want her to be taken care of. I let her make decisions. Not because I'm not an alpha. She has all that authority because she has a lion that's always walking around with that lioness. I make sure that she has everything that she needs. I'm like that that point on the front of the boat, but she's like that cruise liner that exists of the boat. I'll break the waterways so that way she can come in with her anointing. And if I would happen to slip out of my authority, she'll get confused, try to figure out things on her own. She doesn't feel comfortable. She expresses it to me. I need a decision here. I need a, you need to make a decision on this. You need to help me, guide me in this area. Tell me about this. I don't have to run around. I don't have to stand in there. I don't have to puff up my chest. Just have to love on her. Make sure that she has all the equipment necessary because she knows how to make a home. I know how to get a house, but she knows how to make a home. I know how to earn the money, but she knows how to cook the meals. I know how to make sure that she has all the wealth that she needs to buy all the beautiful clothes and everything that she needs. And she's got a big stick, and there's a statement that I, that I say from time to time. I said, baby, I'm just the donkey. You better learn how to ride me well. Because I'll pull this ship wherever it needs to go, but you're the one who's going to drive me. And ladies, hear me well. You are the deciding factor of us men. Hey, we brushed our hair just to meet you. We bought a new shirt just to go out with you. We put on some perfume and cologne to convince you that we were yours. We did everything that we could just to be able to catch you. And we did everything, not asking you. We just wanted to figure out how we could prove it. And to this day, 35 years of marriage, I'm still doing it. We need to recognize that's what a true alpha is. An alpha, a father, is what's lacking inside the home. I went back and I studied all these people, all these men, these young boys who committed these crimes in the school. Obviously, everything that's going on in Uvalde is very sensitive to us. It's here in Texas, down the road. It's a place where I spent many years uh, following my father preaching. He preached up and down Uvalde, up on that highway. And when I heard about what happened over there, as everybody else, we wanted to know how can we solve it. How can this be solved? Not again. And we wait for the politicians to come up with answers. Politicians don't have an answer. And as I began to look at these, I began to recognize not only was it mental health, that the mental situation that those young men were in, but it was also in their upbringing. A lot of them didn't have any fathers. They didn't have any real leaders that were inside their homes. They were abandoned. They were raised by grandma, grandma doing the best that they can, whatever it was, had no, no true leadership inside the house. And I said, Father, what, what can I do? And that's when the Lord told me. He says, if, if the dads would just raise the children up in church 90 minutes a week, we can change a whole community. Now, a person who spends... I spend my life in the Word. Everywhere I go, I'm talking to God. I, I, my amen is only is never an end of a prayer. It's always just an agreement of a, of, a, of a conversation that I'm continually having with my Father. 90 minutes, it doesn't seem like a lot, but 90 minutes can make the world of a difference in any community. 90 minutes a week. 90 minutes is how long the average church service takes, 90 minutes. This service is one hour. This early morning service is one hour. Our second service is an hour and 15 minutes. And it's not that I sit and look at a clock on the second service, but I am uh, thoughtful and mindful that we have a Spanish service at one o'clock. But I also know how long it takes to teach the children. I also know how long the children's uh, mind and attention is available. I know that they're not going to sit in a room for an hour and a half. And sit still, I'll be torturing our teachers if we did that. So I'm mindful. So an hour and 15 minutes at our 11 o'clock service where the house is full. And the children's churches are 
or to capacity. We need helpers that will help in the children's ministry. 90 minutes is all it takes to be able to raise a family in the things of God. 90 minutes a week, but we don't even... Many in the community, I can't say we because I'm not including myself or Center Church into that, but these young men who did what they did was because they were not raised in the church. They weren't raised under the cares of God. They they weren't raised in the word of God. They didn't spend their mornings in prayer for five minutes. I have my granddaughter that I drop her off at at school and, and we have a conversation in the, in the car in the morning. And before we get there, I, I, I asked the Lord, I said, cover her with the precious blood of Jesus, put angels around it about her. And she hears me. She hears this being said. And when I drop her off, I say, remember, you got the mind of Christ and everything that you'll learn from the teachers you'll obtain in Jesus name. And she goes, thank you, grandpa. Every morning she hears it. You ask her, she'll tell you. My children were raised the very same way every one of them. And I had the pleasure, I want to say this, I've had the pleasure and the honor that to this day, my children want to sit in a room with me and just talk to me and just tell me how their day was and find out how my day was. And they don't, they don't go running on the TV and turn it on, try to flip through channels. They don't want to, they don't want me to go play video games with them. They don't go hide themselves. They spend the day with me, spend time with me. Why is that? Sometimes I may say, I just want, man, I just want to sleep. My wife and I would be asleep in, in bed. And my, my son, Caleb Michael, reminded me this past week. Caleb Michael would tell me, he says, remember, Dad, when I came back from being with my friends, I'd walk into the bedroom. He, he would turn the lights on and say, hey, guys, I want to talk. I loved it. I loved it. Because then I knew if he was drinking, I know I'd smell it. If he was smoking, you know I'd smell it. And guess what? He knew that if he didn't come into the house or into the room, he knew that I would be thinking that way. So every time he went out and hung out with the boys and stayed out past 11 o'clock, it didn't matter if it was 12 or 1 o'clock, he'd turn the light on. Hey, mom and dad, talk to me. And then we'd be like this, turn the light off. Nope, I want to see you. And he'd sit with us for an hour. How many times did that happen, hun? That's what it is when you're an alpha. Your children will be brought up that way, respectful. So I want to tell you that are watching online, what's missing in your home is not so much just an alpha person. What's missing in the home is a, is a father that's willing to rise up and raise the children and the care and the concerns of the Lord. We need to pray. We need to speak to God. I'm going to run through a few scriptures here real quick because I think are important. In John chapter 1, verse 12, it says, But as many as received him, talking about Jesus, to them he gives a right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name. This is a key scripture. Not everybody is a child of God. So a lot of people think, well, aren't we all children of God? No, no, not according to the scriptures. Matter of fact, even in this scripture, it says, but as many as received him, he's talking about Jesus, to as many as received Jesus, to them, to them who received Jesus, to them, he, Jesus, gave the right, the right, which means the ability to become, which means future tense, a child of God. When you accept Jesus, you have the right to become. You're not the child of God yet. You just have the right to become a child of God. That means you have the ability to become the child of God. It's your choice whether you want to be a child of God. It's your choice whether you want to be a son of God. It's your choice. God is a, he's a faithful God. He's a gentleman. And he gives you the ability to accept whether you are his child or not his child. It's your choice. You came from him. But it's your choice whether you want to be a child of God. And how do you become a child of God? Act like him. Talk like him. Get to know him. It's a relationship. In verse 13 says, Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but God. You must be born of God. How are you born of God? By accepting Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life. The Bible says that we all came from God. The Bible says that he found us in him. And so then he called us out of him to be holy and blameless before him in love. That's how we become a child of God. That we become holy, that we get into the word, that we're sanctified by the word. 
and that we're always in front of him. How dare we say that we're a child of God, yet we never spend any time with our heavenly father. How dare we? How dare we? Who do we think we are? In Proverbs chapter 1, verse 8, it says, My son, hear the instructions of your father and do not forsake the law of your mother. Watch this. What does it take to be a son? Hear the instructions of your father. Some people don't read the word because they're intimidated with the size of the Bible. Spend two minutes. Spend five minutes. Read the word. Do you know it could take you by average 12 minutes to read an entire book of the Bible. It takes 88 hours to read everything of the Bible from cover to cover. Take you 8 to 12 minutes to read the whole book of Hebrews. It takes you about a minute and a half to read all of uh, James. About a minute and a half, two minutes to read all of James. Think about this. We're so intimidated by the size of the book that we don't even spend two minutes reading scriptures. It's amazing. I, I, I have this uh, TikTok account for Center Church. And uh, I, I produce these little videos that I put on TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. And these little tiny videos are three verses that I read. The little music in the background. Thousands of people listen to those three verses. It takes 30 seconds. I take my time and I read those. But what I haven't said is this, how many comments that I've received and instant messages that I've received from strangers that said they had no idea those scriptures were in there. The scriptures that I'm reading, specific about prosperity, healing, deliverance, specific scriptures. And I didn't know it said that. Some of the most famous scriptures. I'm amazed on how many people didn't know. And they didn't know because they didn't have a father that was an alpha, according to the word of God, raising their child up in the way they should go. How do you become a son? Here are the instructions of your father. Pay attention to them. All fathers are developed by dads and moms. Every father is developed by a mom and dad somewhere, somehow. Even if they don't remember their dad, there were spiritual or physical dads that were around them. What I'm amazed are not just my children, but I'm amazed on those that are in the ministry that even see us as spiritual fathers. And I'm going to end with this passage in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 through 3. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God and it has not been, it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, but as he is pure. When our father is revealed to us, we're going to recognize all these personalities that are in us from him. People of God. Jesus is coming. And he's coming by a throne that will be established on this earth. Yes, we will be raptured. Yes, we will be with him. But we will come again. And we will live with him. The Bible says, Jesus makes a statement. He says, in my father's house are many mansions. I'm going to prepare a place for you. That's what a father does. He takes care of you. He nourishes you. He makes sure that you have a future. My friend, it doesn't matter if you're a grandpa or you're a dad. You have people around you that look at you as a father. Be that strong arm, be that pillar, and give the scriptures and the word to your children and your grandchildren. Even if they don't wanna hear it, say it louder, say it often, pick a scripture, and every time they see you, talk to them about that scripture. 
And you watch how you'll be able to bring them and you'll be able to win them back. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we worship you and we thank you that you have prepared us for this day. That we could be fathers and mothers. That we could be leaders and alphas in our family. That we can touch the lives of people around us. Father, we ask you that you motivate and maneuver inside us. That we may be able to come out better, cleaner, purer. We can be your child. We accept you, Father, as our Father. Accept us as your child. Forgive us of our sins. Wash them all away. Come live inside us and allow the world to see that I am a blood-bought child of the living God. In Jesus' precious name. And everybody said, Amen. Give the Lord a loud praise offering. Come on.